Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first class that we've done in a while since Retire Me. I'm Don McDonald. Tom's there in the room with you. I've got my new mug and my new shirt. And that's what we're going to talk about is keeping calm so you can retire better. And what, what do we mean? Why are we suggesting you keep calm? Well, because people get a little bit crazy from listening to the news, paying attention to current events, hearing all the pundits out there telling you what to do and why to do it. So what we're going to try and do today in just about an hour with Q&A is to give you some reasons to not worry as much, to show you that the market works and it works well, even in times that feel uncertain and even scary. So we're going to spend a lot of time going through the facts of investing. And to tell you how we're going to do that and, and what we're going to do along the way, here's my partner, Tom. Thank you, Don. I do want to mention a couple of things. Don mentioned that we're going to try to go about 40, 45 minutes and then open it up to questions. And we can do that uh, virtually or in person, however, whatever works for you. Um, we'll also make op an opportunity to get a uh, free, a hidden levers plan for anybody who wants one. This is a look at, and I think for those of you who came in person, there's a sheet in there to sign up for one. This is a look at your current holdings in terms of uh, how much risk you're taking, how diversified you are, how much you're paying others. It also has some projected um, winnings and losings, if you will, ups and downs. It, it goes through your whole portfolio. We do this absolutely free. We just, we, you give us your assets, uh, the statements, we plug it all in and we go through this report. It's really a great one because most of us don't really understand how diversified we are. Most of us don't know how much risk we're taking. And uh, very, 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 very few of us really understand how much we're paying others. It's a fascinating process. So we do that absolutely free. And that's our offer to you today. For those of you in person, I can see some people have taken advantage of the shirt. You can get a shirt or a mug uh, with the wonderful Retire Strong. So we love that. But I want to just take a minute before Don starts the presentation. Some of this work comes from a book called Your Money and Your Brain from Jason Zweig. You, if you're a regular podcast listener, you know that we have a high degree of respect for Jason's work. He continues to write a weekly column, The Intelligent Investor, that appears in the Wall Street Journal. I think you can get it outside of the journal as well. But this book came was uh, written back in 2007, and he coined the term, which I'd never heard before, neuroeconomics. But before I turn it over to Don, I want to read you a couple of pieces here that I think are valuable, because Jason says, in theory, um, for example, you have clear and consistent financial goals. In practice, you're not sure what your goals are. Last time you thought you knew you had to change them. This is another part of the work that we do when we sit down with people to really find out what you're trying to achieve and match up your portfolio, the, the financial part with that. We find very few people do that. And then here's the other, there's many of these in the book, but the other one I really like was, the more closely you follow your investments, the more money you'll make. In other words, the idea that you're keeping track of what's going on current events, markets, et cetera, and that's the theory. And as Wag points out, in practice, people who keep up with the news about their stocks earn lower returns than those who pay almost no attention. And that's not his data. That's not our data. That's data from uh, uh, academics. I think you should trust their work is, is disinterested. They simply want to see how we all do as investors. So with that, I'm going to let Don start our presentation. He's going to talk about some of the things in terms of portfolio development some of the mistakes we see, and then I will come back and spend some time on, on Social Security, uh, withdrawals from your portfolio, some of the mistakes that I see around the emotions of all this, how to squeeze those out and have a, have a great retirement. So uh, someone asked very kindly when, how long I've been working with Don. Our relationship goes back to 1988. I was programming a radio station here in Seattle, and he had a national program called the Ways and Means Committee. It later became the Don McDonald Show. So we've been working together since, gosh, is that 35 years? A long time. And uh, he's a great partner and a terrific friend. And with that, please take over, Don. Yeah, okay, I'll take over. 
Um, <laughs> we might, let me just turn down the, uh, the audio coming back from them because it's a little echoey. Hi, everybody. Don here again. Uh, welcome to the control center of Talking Real Money. That's what this little cave in which I live is. And uh, today we want to talk about the news and how the news affects you guys. Uh, how, how you do things you shouldn't do because you <gasps> panic. I mean, as Tom mentioned, we're all worried about the debt ceiling now, that this is going to cause the entire world to collapse economically. And while it's always possible, it's unlikely because we have had multiple, multiple times when the, the, uh, the world was in serious trouble. So what we want you to do is to learn why you need to just sit back, relax, and as they said back in the, um, this was 1938, the slogan, the keep calm and carry on, keep calm so that you can retire strong. And that is the point of most of our savings. We are doing what we do to retire better with the bulk of our money. First thing we worry about, and you know, it was funny, we didn't worry about it for years, then we worried about it a lot last year, and now maybe it's a little less. We don't know. Inflation has come down some, but that's one of the big worries. Inflation. What is inflation going to do to our money? Is it going to erode our purchasing power? How do we protect our money? And then, of course, all the salespeople out there go, gold, real estate. Oh, do we have a good story on real estate coming up on a future podcast? There are no easy ways to beat inflation immediately, but doing the right things with your portfolio can help you ameliorate the problem of inflation over time. Then there's the debt ceiling, currently in discussions. As Tom said, we've got a great podcast coming up with Wes Krill in which we will talk about the debt ceiling and whether the fear is misplaced or not. Yes, if somebody, somebody, some buddies in our government allow us to get to the point where we default on our debt, it could very well cause some economic problems. But the likelihood that those economic problems will last long is slow. And you'll find out why it's, I mean, it's low. You'll find out why it's low based on things that have happened in the past. The bond default that could come from that. What will that do to our ability to raise money in the future? Will the U.S. debt rating be downgraded? Uh, will your bonds go down in value? We don't know, but there's a lot we don't know about the future. We can look back at the past. And will all of this cause a recession? Well, recessions are part of the story of humanity, of the story of economies. We have always suffered through recessions, depressions, economic catastrophes. However, as we have grown societally, we have become a lot better at defending against them. We we have some tricks up our sleeve, and I wouldn't I, I wouldn't put it past us to figure out a way out of a recession more quickly than not. But you never know. That's why you hedge your bets. If you will recall back, uh, let's see, this was in 2008. It was October of 2008. This was the cover of Time Magazine in 2008, October 2008. We got a soup line, just like the Great Depression. And if you remember back to 2008, it was a scary time. There were many who believed that we were falling into another Great Depression. Stock prices fell more than they did in 1929. And there was a lot of talk about it being the end of the economic world. And then a few months later, the bear market ended, the economy perked up, and we went through an incredibly long period of rising stock prices, of course, with a few little scares along the way. But that's why the stock market rewards you, because it scares you along the way. That's part of the process. It's supposed to do that. If the stock market didn't move at all, the returns 
would be about those of banks or bonds. They'd be very stable, but with low returns. So to accept the risk of the stock market is part of the process of making the money you need to retire comfortably. Now, let's we'll talk about stocks because we just recently on the podcast talked to a gentleman who wanted to double down or triple down or quadruple down on his Tesla. And the fact of the matter is any single stock, we're not talking about individual stocks here, we're talking about in aggregate. Any individual stock can go to zero, any one of them. Check this out. This is First Republic Bank. And this is very recently. This was from May of, of 2022 through May of 2023. The stock, let me put my old man glasses back on. The stock dropped from $139 a share to essentially worthless to 47 cents a share on May 10th when I put this slide together. That is a huge, huge drop and one that wasn't expected until the very last minute. And even then, if you look back to March, you can see that the stock price was holding up pretty well. And then you had a few up people coming in and buying it down here on the dip and they got destroyed. Any stock can go to zero. I don't care how good it is or how bad it is. Tesla could go to zero. Apple could go to zero. You can lose everything in a single stock, but can you lose everything? If you are so diversified that you own the entire global stock market. Now let's go back a long time. Let's go back to 1926. We're almost going back a hundred years. That's what the stock market has done. The S and P 500, which is the proxy for the stock market over almost a hundred years. And you can see along the way, 1929 down here, huge dip in the 30, more big dips. But as time goes by, the increases certainly outnumber the big decreases. 2001 here, 2008 here, et cetera, et cetera. The entire stock market held up really well over a hundred years. You have to accept risk though, to be a, be a proper, to be a decent investor, to make any money, you have to accept risk. You have to accept that volatility of the stock market. Here's one of my favorite charts. Take a look, same period, 2026 20, to 2022, inflation a dollar, Increased to $16 due to inflation over almost 100 years. Treasury bills got you up to about $22. Ooh, a dollar became 22 over 100 years. If you went with longer term, more scary bonds, well, you might have gotten close to 200 bucks over 100 years. But if you invested in big U.S. stocks, well, all U.S. stocks, actually, the entire U.S. stock market, globally or nationally diversified, would have seen that dollar grow to about 14,000. Oh, oh, I forgot the really aggressive stocks, uh, small cap stocks, the little companies, uh, try $37,000 plus. Risk has brought reward. Will it bring the same kind of reward in the future? We don't know. All we know is what has happened and what has happened has been some pretty impressive returns over a long period of time. So can you trust predictions? Mm, no, because nobody knows the future. What you have to trust are the facts and the only facts we know are facts in past tense, everything is in past tense. And the future is 100% absolutely unpredictable. As a matter of fact, the only time, the only time that people predict the future accurately 
is when they get lucky. And yet the psychology of our species is such that we can't, we don't, we're not comfortable with luck. We really aren't. We are far more comfortable with some power that allows some people to have the ability to do things that when we think about it for a minute, we know they cannot possibly do. You can't. You need to trust the facts, trust the past, that it will be something like the future, and hang in there because that's all you can do. Now, I want to just show you some facts, some data. We, we hear a lot of talk in the media about how, well, value stocks were dead. Money value stocks were dead, but they're not dead recently. Small companies are worse than large companies. Heard this from a couple of pundits recently. But here's the reality based on real live research. Over any 10 year period from again, 26 through 2022, to the end of 22, any 10 year period, value stocks outperformed growth oriented stocks 79% of the time. Sometimes they didn't. Five years, 70%, one year, 60%. Even over a year, the odds are in your favor if you over invest in value stocks. Value stocks mean, just for all of you who are playing along at home, those are stocks whose assets are probably worth more than the company. A company whose stock price is low, but who have higher inherent intrinsic value. Smaller companies beat larger companies. Why do smaller companies beat larger companies pretty consistently? Simple. They're more risky. Risk has to be rewarded in the marketplace. Over any 10 year period, as you saw in that previous chart too, small company stocks have beaten large company stocks 70% of the time over any 10 year period. So trust the facts, value the data, be a smart investor and ignore the noise. Be incredibly skeptical of any claims of predictive power. Trust those who do the real research, the academics. Academic research is your friend. Anecdotes are worthless. Evidence is valuable. Data is valuable. And understand risk. This is one of the most difficult things for us to do. There, there are really two kinds of risk when it comes to investing. There's the first republic risk that I talked about earlier where you can lose everything. That's big risk. The possibility of losing everything, that's the ultimate risk. However, as, you, as I showed you with just the S&P 500, if you owned that consistently over any long period of time, longer period, more than five years, pretty much, you would have made money and you would have never lost it all. It was impossible. You couldn't have. You didn't. We saw it. It, it happened. Think about the only, only scenario in which someone who owns the entire stock market, and I'm talking about U.S. and international, Give me a scenario in which you can lose every single penny you invested. I bet you can't think of any that are realistic. I mean, we already thought of one and tried it. We actually tested the theory that we could destroy the global economy with a worldwide war. We did that from 1938 to 1945. And while it was horribly destructive, Terrifying. The economy survived. The economy of the entire world, wait, not only survived, it thrived. So if you diversify your investments, you really don't have to worry. You can keep calm. And, well, we hope to keep calm and retire strong. Uh, Tom's up next. He wants to talk to you a little bit about some of the strategies you can use going forward that might help you stick 
stick it out, stay the course, and enjoy the retirement you need with the money you need to do so. Tom? Again, the, the premise of our talk today is about the emotions that you feel and how to deal with those and, and, and get through difficult times and make good, better decisions. And the biggest decision most of us uh, are going to be dealing with in retirement is around Social Security. And we're going to, oh, there we go. Um, your instinct is, and we see this all the time, when you wake up at 62, give me my money. It's my money. I want it. I want it from the government. And I'm worried now, right? It's going to run out in 10 years. It's a problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, I need the money because I'm going to quit work. That's your instinct. But what we want you to do is wait. And the numbers bear this out. And I was doing this with my uh, five-year-old grandson the other day. So it's 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48, 56, 64. That's how much more 64% raise if you wait from age 62 to age 70. That does not include compounding. You know, that's just straight linear. 64% more. And yet it's still about a third of us who wake up at age 62 and take it, a third. And it's a very small number of people that wait until age 70 to take it. It's like still like three or 4% that's gone up a lot because people have been more educated lately. But your selection is a permanent selection. Once you do that, now with a slight caveat that you can uh, go back and change it within six months and give them their money back and, and hit reset again. But it's a huge decision. And there's other ways often to pay the bills and wait on Social Security because we don't know of any strategy. Don, myself, Joyce has joined us, one of our senior advisors here. We don't know any way to make 8% a year guaranteed. If we do, we'll share it with you. all. Uh, you can be sure we'll manage it that way with our clients. So, but we don't know that. And yet Social Security provides that. And we try to give you the numbers, which are here up on the screen, right, to make this pretty clear because what you're looking at here is the difference of income uh, between 62 and 70. Starting on the left here, uh, you can see that you're, by the time you reach 85, if you started 62, you would have received $180,000 of income. At full retirement age, you're getting $1,800 a month, you would have received $246,000. At a 70, instead of getting the 180, you would be getting $315,000. Now, here's the thing. You got to live about 10 years from the time you claim Social Security. So if you don't, I'm just talking about some, somebody recently, a very well-known basketball coach that I knew, uh, had famously said at age 68, I'm waiting until 70, and he died at about 70 years, six months. I thought, well, that was, turned out to be a bad decision, right? Didn't get any of his money. That happens. But the numbers firmly show. And by the way, if you, if you live to 65, it's almost a one out of two chance that if you're married, one of you will live till 90. So the, the odds then become much greater for longevity. But waiting is huge. And, and it's a fascinating to me psychologically because we run into a lot of people that simply leave their job and think that they have to claim Social Security at that time. We, we had a client uh, who tried at age 65 until he called us. We said, you can draw money from your portfolio. He was going to work part time. We said, let's do those and wait on Social Security, which he agreed to do to wait until age, age 70. And by the way, in his situation, he was married. He was the higher wage earner. So it made a ton more sense for him to wait because the expectation is he would die first. His wife will either get keep her benefit or inherit his. And in his case, uh, he, she'd be inheriting his. So there's a lot of reasons, uh, especially if you're married, to make this a, a big part of your retirement planning. We see people make tons of mistakes. And this has been one of the things we've talked about for many, many years. So that's one. The next one is around the market, and we're seeing this uh, today. Uh, millions and billions of dollars are moving out of stocks and bonds into money markets. Uh, we're seeing this, the weak flows are incredible, weekly flows, pardon me. Uh, and so why? Well, because money markets, you're gonna say, are now paying four or 5%. I'm making big money in money markets. Well, uh, and it feels safe, right? Because certainly stocks feel risky as they always did, as Don correctly points out. If it's not the debt ceiling crisis, it's another crisis. Uh, bonds had a bad year last year. We lost money in both stocks and bonds. Why do I want to be in those things when I can get the guaranteed four or 5%? Well, again, looking back over the long haul, 
You've made more in both stocks and bonds than in money market. The money market really should be a place to use cash. If you have an upcoming expense, if you want emergency funds, something like that, that's the money market. But what I troubled is when people try to time things, the instinct is, I don't wanna lose money. I, I, got, I got this amount, we run into this with our clients all the time. I'm retired, this is all the money I'm gonna have for the rest of my life, I don't wanna lose it. So therefore, I feel like I need to do something, I need to, to move my money. And we try to remind people that your asset allocation, your asset allocation, each one of yours is yours. It should have nothing to do with the market or the world or the debt crisis or the rest of it. Your stock to bond ratio, how much you have in various risky and less risky assets is about you and your future, your time horizon, your ability to accept volatility has nothing to do with current events. And that's one of the themes I hope of today that, that you understand. But missing out is huge. And we're trying to show you here on the slide how big it is. And by the way, most of the days, the big days that people miss come in down years. So some of these days are from years like 2008, where people bailed. We had clients that were calling us, uh, one of the reasons my wife's portfolio is managed with less risk than, than mine, is she can remember me calling people back at 10 o'clock at night, telling them, no, your portfolio is okay. You've lost the money, but you're gonna hang in there because you don't want to sell at the wrong time. But people were selling at the wrong time, right? And missing just what we're showing you here is if you just invested in this period from 1990 to 2021, basically 30 years and you just were in the S&P 500, you, your thousand bucks went to 26,000. Had you missed the one of the best, the best day there, you're down to 23,000, et cetera, et cetera. You can see all the way over here, if you missed the 25 best days, your $26,000 is only $9,000. And we see people doing this over and over again. Timing requires being right twice, right? You got to know when to get in, you got to know when to get out. And we had somebody else we just talked to the other day that got out in 2008 and is still waiting to get back in. And we tried to explain to him that that's not how you manage your money. He said, well, I'm kind of waiting for the market to stabilize. Well, it had a pretty long period, as Don pointed out, from 2009 till basically 2020, when it was in a pretty strong bull market. And then even after the, 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 the virus crisis, if you will, um, it, it rebounded strongly after that. Timing is a bad strategy all the way around. And so what we believe is, again, you have the correct asset allocation. You need to know what that asset allocation is. You need to accept the volatility that goes with that because many of you want to make the money, but I don't ever want to see my portfolio go down. And you need to learn how to tune out the bad stuff because the bad stuff is going to come. And once the debt crisis is settled, it'll be on to the election. It'll be on to the next crisis in Europe. It'll be on to whatever it is. Inflation didn't go fat, down fast enough. Interest rates aren't going to be decreased fast enough. All those things are there every single day. And they're great because they give people like us something to talk about on the podcast, because otherwise we give you the four funds you need to, get, to use and you wouldn't hear from us again. But it turns out that many of you have questions about the other. So the point is stay properly invested and, and, and don't mess around with your portfolio. The number one question we get on the podcast and radio show, and I hope you, for those of you here in Bellevue, listen to us on the station formerly known as Como between noon and two on Saturdays, Northwest News Radio. And for those of you who don't, the podcast, we have a new podcast five days a week. The number one question we get is, I just came into money, what do I do with it? The number two question is, will my money survive my retirement? That's always the question. People wanna know, here's how much I've saved, will it work? Does the plan work? And the answer always is on the radio show, it depends because we don't know enough about you. We don't know how much you're spending. We don't know how your portfolio is positioned. We don't know how long you're likely to live. And by the way, the only correct withdrawal rate you really know is after you're gone, right? Then we'll be able to tell whether it worked or not because up till then we're not exactly positive. But in a general sense, Withdrawal rates. Some some of you who've followed our work for a long time know that we oftentimes talk about a 4% withdrawal rate, right? Taking out 4% of your portfolio fixed every year, adding in every year for inflation. We've shown this at retirement. We've shown this at numerous classes over the last 30 plus years. And generally that works. But here's the part that's important. You need to be invested. You need to be invested properly. You need to be properly diversified because there are periods of time, we showed you the S&P 500, but the S&P, remember, for 10 years 
before the crisis uh, really of 08, had a period where it was underwater. And you had to be invested in small stocks. You had to be invested in value stocks. You had to be invested in international stocks. You've got to have that asset allocation all the time. And you have to have the right balance between stocks and bonds all of the time. So what withdrawal rate does work? Well, again, 4% does over the long haul. We're gonna show you this, the numbers here on the slides. Don and I have, so, have said publicly that we're planning on taking a 5% variable withdrawal every year. In other words, January 1st of the year, here's my balance, I'm taking out 5%. Now I know what my budget is for the next year. If I have a good year, I've said this again, not a great joke. You can go to a certain water park uh, in uh, down near Kent. If you have a bad year, if you have a good year, you take everybody to Hawaii instead, right? You decide which is, the, there's a trade-off in your life. And so, but what we're trying to show you here is, it's interesting. Morningstar just came out with this study very recently. We'll be glad to send it to you as well, if you'd like. But Morningstar found that the people that have their money kind of more balanced between stocks and bonds end up, with a more successful draw rate. So the columns here are the length of time uh, in retirement. And then we refer to the stock to bond ratio, 100% is 100% in stocks and no bonds. And how much you can take out of the portfolio and still have it survive for that period of time. I'd always thought, frankly, that if you took more risk, right? If you were 80% in stocks and 20% in bonds, you could take more money out. Well, it turns out that's not right. And the reason that's not right is being a more balanced approach gives you another sense of diversification, right? Because stocks and bonds are very different types of security. Stocks are investments in companies. Bonds are IOUs. These are very different types of securities. So being balanced, you can see here, the 20 year withdrawal, you could take over 5% a year and the portfolio still survive. So for example, if you don't draw on your portfolio till 70, well, if you take out 5% a year, you live till 90, it still works out pretty well. Um, and by the way, some people we work with uh, tell us we've got it all wrong. They don't care if, it, if you run out of money at the end, they want the last check they write to bounce. That's another bad joke. Okay, so Don, I can hear Don laughing. So, but the point here, the, the part that was interesting was that really being in the middle, more middle of the road, not taking a lot of risk, not taking any risk, ends up the portfolio survives longer, hangs in there and is more successful. There isn't one right or wrong here, right? Because each of you know uh, your situation or should, and that's why we offer the free uh, planning session as well, because you've got to know what rate of return you need. You need to know how much risk you're willing to take. And then you need to know how to set up your portfolio properly. One of the other sort of instinctual issues we see all the time is you look at your portfolio and say, give me the free money. I want the free money from interest and I want the free money from dividends. This has been a huge area of contention, especially recently, where people have signed up for high dividend payout mutual funds, stocks that pay out big dividends, because then I get sort of the guaranteed, if you will, 4% or whatever. Remembering our diversified portfolio, the dividend payout is somewhere around 2%. So you still get that. And in our portfolio, you're getting the interest from uh, the bonds as well but we don't pay them out directly. Instead, we use a total return type of strategy. That is, we, you have a, a certain amount that you need every year to draw the portfolio, right? We let all of these things ride, the dividends, the interest, all that builds up in your account. And then when you need the money, we pay it out and rebalance the account. So we can take things that have gone up, put it in things that haven't done as well and pay you. Conversely, people that think, there's, I'm getting something for nothing. That's the emotion truly of the kind of free money, if you will. High yield bonds, well, those bonds can default. Emerging markets bonds we find to be very risky. This has been a place people have moved a lot of money in lately, which troubles me. Long-term bonds, well, you saw what happened to long-term bonds last year, right? Any bond over about 15 years lost, I think, more than 20% of its value. We manage money with short and intermediate term bonds because the risk is exactly what you found out when interest rates goes up. This is another one that troubles me, REITs. We use real estate investment trusts in our portfolio, but we use them by owning hundreds of REITs. We don't go buy non-publicly traded REITs. We don't buy private REITs. We're not trying to hit a home run here. We're looking for a little more portfolio stabilization, but we're not trying to create a big dividend. And here, the one at the bottom, as I said, has been the big, big player for the last few years as interest rates have been very low. And people have said, I need something to create regular income. So I can do that through high dividend paying stocks. 
This isn't our work. This is the work of the academics that find that high dividend paying stocks oftentimes can reduce their payouts. They have much higher volatility. When you only own those, you've reduced your diversification, which we think is the one key thing that you can all do, whether you hire somebody or do it on your own, and that is be massively diversified into thousands of companies because there will be periods of time when parts of those will do well and parts will not do well. So again, we believe in a total return strategy versus dividends and interest. That's the way we manage money. And we think it's the best way to do that through rebalancing. And then finally, your instinct when it comes to planning is a fascinating one to me because we talk to so many people. We're blessed because so many people call us from the podcast or, or come and see us. And they, we talk about the planning part and they're just not interested. What you really want to know is how much money are you going to make me, Tom? How are you going to make me rich? How, where's, I, want, I just want to sign up and check the box. You, you guys showed that uh, an all stock portfolio from 1970 through the end of 2022 made something like 11%. I'll just circle that and check it. And you go ahead and provide that, right? Whereas we try to move you back and we've got two of our advisors here. They're going to tell you, no, it's really about the plan. And you're like, well, that's not very interesting. And I don't really like sitting down and going through all those numbers. And the part that you really hate is the budget. How much can you spend? And this is no fun in my household either, by the way, because when I start digging into stuff, what, why are we paying for this subscription? Or do we really need to spend this much on our hair, et cetera? I know my hair looks great. But the, the point of the matter is you don't want to talk about that. So the instinct is, I just, just give me my money every year and I don't want to have to build the plan. But it really is the most important part of your your future finances. How you're invested, yeah, that's pretty important. Um, whether you time markets, all those sort of things, absolutely. But you need to have the plan absolutely first, knowing what your needs are. And this is the toughest part because people come in every day and tell us, I only spend $60,000 a year. We had a guy come in last year and said, I think he spent 70,000. Well, he and his wife had a combined income of 300,000. And he was trying to tell us he only spent 70. I said, you're either great savers or you're giving the government too much of your money. When we finally wheedled it all out, he was actually spending closer to $120,000 in actual spending. You got to know that. And you got to know what your needs are going to be in the future. And for most of us in retirement, we run our plans at 100% of what you're spending today. We do not reduce it. No, you don't have to drive to work anymore. No, you don't need the fancy suits that Mitch has on anymore. But, but there's other ways you spend your money, it turns out, on vacations, grandkids, there's things like that that you end up spending on. So you need to know that. Then you need to know your assets. Don coined the phrase hodgepodge portfolio. We see it every day. Many of you have an account at Vanguard. That's great. But then you also have an account at LPL Financial or you have your 401k and you don't know what that portfolio looks like. And that's why I mentioned getting the, the report that we do absolutely free. And you can sign up for that either online or in person. Where we look at your assets, we'll tell you exactly how diversified you are, how much risk you're taking, how much you're paying others. You got to know that. You need to know where the money is and how you access it properly. And then creating the plan, because most people don't have a retirement income plan. They've been great savers in many ways. They've set money aside, and they don't know that there's important decisions to be made to where to draw the money. And I forgot to mention a, a gentleman in terms of withdrawals that came to us one year. He had about... $800,000 in a taxable account. He had a Roth IRA of, I think it was half a million. And then he had an IRA of about 300,000. He tried to go into Schwab and just take all the money from his IRA. And we told him, we don't want to do that because that's coming out and you're paying straight income tax on that. You want to figure out which pot to draw on to do this correctly. That gets back to having the right kind of plan. Then you can get into the exciting stuff about building the portfolio, right? Owning some of those small stocks that Don mentioned owning value firms, being an international, having emerging markets, having exposure to all of these things, and then the right balance between that and uh, bonds. And then the toughest part, frankly, that we see, we're seeing it again today. Um, I mean, today in terms of all of us is the emotions. And, and Vanguard uh, again released their survey here recently that looked at the value that a firm like ours offers or a registered investment advisor that uses low cost index or index style products. And yes, the portfolio adds value. Yes, the rebalancing adds value, but the greatest value, according to Vanguard, their own study is the work that we do adds about 2% a year to your return because we build the plan and we keep you on track because you call us and say, 
I got to move everything to cash until the debt crisis is solved. Or I hate this guy that's the new president. Or look what's going on in Ukraine. I got to get my money out. I'll wait to get back in. And our job, the, any advisor's job is to say, we looked at all this for you. The right way is to be invested the way you are and to tune all this out, find something else to do today instead of worrying about this regularly. Discipline, discipline, discipline. That's the, that's the takeaway from a class. That's why we're talking about keeping calm and retiring strong. I hope that helps. And by the way, as I said, uh, either in person here, you can sign up for a plan. I think we sent you the email link if you want to do it online. We do that absolutely free. We're happy to help anybody you become our client or not. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Don take a few of the questions here, Don, and um, take it away. And uh, let me take the first one here, Tom. Would it be better to invest in small, mid, and large cap individual ETFs slash index funds? Or would it be better to invest in something like VTI that encompasses the entire stock market? I like having small and mid cap companies funds in addition to some large cap funds in terms of diversity. Thanks. It, <laughs> Tom mentioned this answer earlier. Uh, it depends. If you're doing it yourself, here's a better way. If you're a you're not a large investor, you don't have a huge portfolio and you want to keep it really simple, I'm only going to discuss the equity portion of the portfolio with you, but here's something to think about. VTI, no, not VTI. Where's your international exposure? You've got to quit this provincial investing where there is only one global market, the United States. You need an international portfolio, a global portfolio which is why VT, the Vanguard Total World Stock Index ETF, makes more sense for a base of the fund, a foundation of your portfolio. And then if you're a DIYer, you add a, a small cap value. Uh, maybe later you can add an emerging markets or a REIT fund or something like that. But keep it simple if you're doing it on your own. Having a whole bunch of funds isn't going to add anything because really there's no evidence that mid cap adds much in the way of return. So why add that? You already own some mid cap in a globally diversified portfolio like VT, but there is evidence that overweighting value and overweighting fall has added to return. So that's what I would suggest. Now, the next question I'm gonna give here to Tom I understand the portfolio premium in small cap and value over the long term, say during one's accumulation years. However, if they are already in the decumulation phase of retirement, is it too late to begin using a portfolio tilted towards small in value? Drawing down the equity portion of the portfolio to live on will reduce the portfolio growth and reduce the effect of small cap and value. Your thoughts? So the basic question is, should your uh, equity portfolio look different as you're accumulating money? In other words, should you own a different group of stocks then than when you're retired? And my answer is uh, no, your equity portfolio should be the same. The difference is the fixed income portion, how much you have in the stable, uh, stable part of the portfolio. Because if you're drawing and the stock market is going down, has gone down, you want to make sure you have enough in bonds so you can draw it. I'll give you an example. So if you had a million dollar portfolio and you're drawing out $50,000 a year and you have half in stocks, half in bonds, right? 500,000 each one. You could draw on the bond portfolio for 10 years before you had to touch the stocks at all. Then on the other side of the equation, the question really revolves around, well, should I still own small and value if I'm 70 years old and my time horizon is only 20 years instead of 40 years? My answer would be absolutely, because number one, we don't know when the premiums are gonna be paid by small. It's a fascinating thing. Sometimes it comes very quickly. Late 2016, small and value went straight up. I think coming out of the 2020 crisis, same thing, it went straight up. It's been, uh, it was really good at the end of last year. You gotta be exposed to those assets all the time and not try to move them around. Um, so I wanna make sure I'm understanding the question, but I believe the question is, should it be different? And when my before my mother passed away, we used to have this debate. Uh, she used to debate me about, well, should I just own the stocks that are a little easier, calmer, not moving around as much, and small is more volatile? And my take was, no, you have the right stock to bond ratio. And in that stock part, you have the proper balance between large, small, value growth, U.S. international. Don makes a great point. Owning VT 
is, is a great way for a smaller account, by the way. And if I was managing more than probably 100,000, I would use a series of exchange traded funds to give you more exposure to those small in value because in VT, you have a small amount, but not as much as I'd like. And number two around that, uh, there's now a, a company called Avantis, which has a global ETF that has more of a small value tilt. And the fund we like there is the global AVGE, AVGE, which is a globally diversified stock portfolio. So I hope that's a good answer, Don, but it's the only one I got. That's a good answer. Now, the next question for me, I'm taking this one. I heard Don, that's me, mention on the radio about six months ago that uh, a Bass Bank, I, B-A-S-K Bank, as in basking in the sun. I moved a large percentage of my savings to an account with them and am now earning 4.6%. I have not heard any mention of this option from either of you since. Why? Well, one, the only reason we mentioned it because is because we looked it up on bankrate.com and it was right there. We don't go out seeking banks and researching banks. We just, for example, look at bankrate.com and see what's high yielding there. So it's not that we think it's bad or it's changed. We, it, it doesn't matter. If you have less than $250,000 in an account, then you're protected no matter what the bank does. So I would not worry about it. Here's an interesting one for you, Tom. How many clients do most financial advisors have? Wow, that's an interesting question. So, I mean, here, the most anybody has is around 100, because we don't think you can really get the, the care you need. I think we have eight advisors, I believe now. Um, I still have a few because people want to keep working with me, uh, which I appreciate. I used to work with somebody at another firm that had 300 and I thought it was outrageous because how can you take care of all those people? I would also ask around an advisor is what the expect your expectations are. How often do you want to meet with the advisor? Now we reach out to everybody every quarter. How often do we meet with people is we try to make it annual. Like we want to sit down and go through everything with you, make sure this is all the plan. How good is the service that you're getting now? Because we just talked to a woman yesterday who says she calls her advisor and sometimes doesn't hear back for three or four days, um, which I think is outrageous. Um, and we actually have telephone numbers where you can call your advisor like right there and they answer the phone um, because we believe in customer service. We believe that your money might give you anxiety. So if we're not there to help you and we have a system where we have backup. So you have an advisor, you have another advisor that works on their team. There's other people that you could always reach somebody if you had an issue that was coming up. So. You know, personally, I would say certainly no more than 125 clients, uh, but I would also be asking the questions around what level of help and service am I getting? Another part of all this, by the way, is for many of the people that we work with, they have held away assets. For example, they're still working. They have a 401k. We show them how to build the 401k. We manage the other money so that it all fits in. Any advisor should make sure your whole plan, your whole portfolio is a one holistic unit rather than, well, we just manage this piece of it. You take care of the rest of it. I don't think that's appropriate uh, as well. Now on to a very unique question. I, I haven't even, I don't, I don't know that we've ever talked about these on the show or the podcast. What is your opinion on closed end funds, specifically buying at a discount to NAV to net asset value? Little history, closed end funds are actually the predecessor to the regular old mutual fund. These were like the first kinds of funds because they were easy, relatively easy to set up. What you did is you created a pool of securities. You sold it to the public. They're a lot like ETFs, but different. Uh, and then they, 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 they stop. They they wouldn't give you your money back from the fund itself. If you wanted to get out of the fund, you had to go sell it in the secondary market, on stock markets or whatever, wherever that might be. And so you got into a bid ask spread. And nowadays, closed in funds, first they're few and far between. There aren't very many of them. Second, the ones I've looked at have really high expense ratios, which helps in part explain the discount because that your you you investors are going to want to pay less for an investment that costs them a lot more every year 
when they hold it because it's that's depleting their assets over time. So I think closed-in funds are pretty much obsolete, and I would I can't think of a, a closed-in fund I would even consider. No, sir. Tom, are Vanguard BND and BNDX a decent way to, to diversify in bonds? Um, I'd probably, I mean, because that BND is an aggregate bond fund. Therefore, you hold, it's about 60% in government. I think it's 30% in corporate, and then 10% in some other things. When we manage money for people, we don't hold that. We have a little bit of corporate, mostly government, and a little bit of other things. Um, because for us, the bond part is the stability. That is the bedrock. BND is going to have a little more motion to it than then we want to have a little more risk to it in some ways. But I think for somebody self-managing, I might use that and I might tag on an intermediate term bond fund. I really like, um, and I use it sometimes to talk about on the podcast, DFIGX, which is dimensionals. I don't know if they have, I don't think they have an ETF equivalent of that yet. But so it gives you a little more stability. Um, an aggregate bond fund is okay. And again, this gets back to the kind of the it depends answer. Um, what your portfolio gets, as I say, to 100,000 plus, I think a little more sophistication makes sense. Um, and therefore, I might manage it with some short term, some intermediate term, primarily U.S., maybe a slice of corporate, just a little bit there for diversification, um, a little bit of international, but pro pr predominantly uh, intermediate and short term U.S. government debt, which we hope will be OK. Um, <laughs> we're planning on it being OK. And um, BND does not offer that. It's a little bit different aggregate bond versus primarily U.S. government. That's how I'd put it. Uh, why do you recommend simple VT, the Vanguard Total World Stock Index type investments for small portfolios and something more complex for larger ones? Isn't it in principle the same regardless of the size of the portfolio? No, it's not actually uh, because, and here's the reason. It's the complexity of managing a larger portfolio. We believe that the larger portfolio with the more specific asset classes that academic research have shown to provide small advantages. Now, bear in mind, these are fractional advantages that those will should have in the past and might over time make you more money than just a broadly based portfolio like VT. However, a broadly based portfolio like VT is going to be better than 90% of the portfolios out there anyway. However, when you get to the bigger money, you can, uh, well, one, that tiny percentage of improvement makes a big difference on big dollar amounts. Two, we don't believe that most people are capable of doing a, a, a five or six or seven or eight or nine fund portfolio, rebalancing it, managing it, not reacting to to the market forces and the bad news, and uh, will very likely mess it up. Whereas holding just a VT is kind of easy. You don't have to do things. You don't have to go, oh, I'm selling my stuff that's going up. I don't like that. That feels bad. Um, so it's really a, a matter of one, making, make, taking advantage of the, 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 the skinny improvements that you get on bigger dollar amounts. And second, you can't get a, a fee-only advisor who's reasonably priced with a portfolio of anything much below a half a million dollars these days. So that's my answer. Tom, here you go. My husband would like to retire at the end of December or early in 2024. Is there an advantage to retiring earlier in the new year? There is, there is an aspect of timing when it comes to retirement because there's been a lot of studies about what they call sequence risk. In other words, if you retired in June of 2008, started pulling on your money, market goes down, you're pulling money out, market's going down, the portfolio probably won't survive as long, right? Versus uh, 2010, after the market's gone up dramatically, you start pulling the money out then. You know, I, I don't look at money that way. Here's how I look at it. The, any financial plan really, like we talk about, should be about you, not about the market. Markets are going to go up. Markets are going to go down. We run plans 
that look at a thousand different scenarios to see how they work in all kinds of markets going back, you know, I think it's 70 years. So good times, bad times, those kind of things. Um, so I, I think it's all about your lifestyle. I think you should decide when's the right to retire. Yes, talk to a professional before you do that. And I think anybody over the age of 50 should have a working plan to say, here's kind of what I'm thinking, especially within, I'd say, five years of retirement. Then you should be more specific about where your income is going to come from, what your portfolio should be like, et cetera. But then you pull the trigger when it's right for you, not necessarily right for the market. And I think that's going to conclude our session today. If we have other questions, we can answer them offline. Mitch is here. Joyce is here to answer questions in person if we have them. I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, help yourself to Don's book. Help yourself to another donut. That's a joke. Um, get, a, get a plan if you want, which you can do by there's a piece of paper inside of here to sign up for that. Uh, and online, you've got that as well. I want to thank you for coming to our sort of inaugural uh, online virtual and in-person uh, chat, and we'll hope to do it again very soon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.